Hello, everyone. <laughs> that was incredibly warm. Thank you. Um, I'm Claire Doran. I'm the area manager for the southeast of England here at the RSA on the, as part of the fellowship team. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all tonight, as you just welcomed me. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder before we kick off that we're filming this um, event tonight and live streaming over the web. So welcome to everyone joining us online. And if you'd like to get involved in the discussion, the hashtag for tonight is RSA Poverty. I hope you'll share your thoughts and experiences with us because tonight's event kicks off an important public conversation addressing a long-standing issue. We'll hear from a range of voices asking crucial questions about poverty and its impact on individual lives and our collective sense of community belonging, social solidarity, and social justice. How can we overcome the toxic and divisive rhetoric around poverty that shames and stigmatizes the most vulnerable in our society? And how do we restore narrative ownership and empowerment to those with lived experience of its effects? We have been able to bring together a fantastic group of people to share their stories with us thanks to the publication of a new book, The Shame Game, by award-winning journalist Mary O'Hara. Mary has been deeply immersed in exploring these issues over a number of years as a reporter and co-founder of Project Twist It, a multi-platform initiative um, focusing on the power of storytelling to flip the script on poverty in the UK and the US. Tonight's event will take the form of a series of short films, reflections, and performances all held together by Mary. So I'm here to thank you in advance for what's in store for the hour or so ahead of us. I'd like to invite you all to give a warm welcome uh, to Mary. Before... Thank you. And to, thank you. And just to help to set the scene, we'll go into a short film for the conversation to follow. Thank you. Most of my work concentrates on social issues, poverty being one of them, and all the interrelated issues to do with poverty. A few years back, at the beginning of austerity in Britain, I was asked to travel the country interviewing people about what was happening, where the damage was being done, what the likely outcomes are going to be of those policies and those cuts down the years. One of the things that came out of that was a sense that people who were bearing the brunt of those policies, people who were either in poverty or on the breadline, felt that they were being demonised um, within their society. They felt that they were being scapegoated, um, that they were being used as props to justify unnecessary cuts. Um, we saw terms like scrounger and skyver and striver all begin to get uh, move into common parlance. There was a, a real feeling from people that it was reducing empathy in the society. Um, so I wanted to do more on that. I wanted to dig a bit deeper and find out what was behind that. We have short film, we have video, audio, animation, poetry, all kinds of ways of expressing a different kind of story that you know, demystifies it to a degree, but also challenges some of the myths. So Project Twisted is basically trying to unpick that narrative um, that to be poor is to be at fault individually. So I wanted to find a way to challenge that narrative um, because in my experience of reporting all of these years, it doesn't stack up with the reality that I see. 
I myself grew up in poverty, um, so I have first-hand experience of it. So I wanted to try and find a way to um, reintroduce some dignity into this discussion and to reduce stereotypes. We've got an animation from the comedian and animator Howard Reed, where he's taken a story of one of the women I interviewed on Skid Row in Los Angeles, who became a mosaic artist, and he's animated her. My name is June Cigar. I'm a piece-by-piece -piece artesian for the Star Apartments on Skid Row Housing Trust in Los Angeles, California. Graphic artist called Shane Pangborn, where we imagine the, the typical low-income family that debunks the myths um, around what it's like to live in those circumstances. I've been interviewing people across in different parts of America and in the UK. In this peacetime country that is somehow more fractured than it ever was during two world wars. In the effort to please all the parties, segregation has become the prevailing solution. They're trying to put me to the test, but I dropped out of college, I ain't ready for that yet. Yeah, still. I got my common sense, you got a sports B-Tech and cat butter bread, the wheels on the bus go around. My name is Jamila Jamil and I'm an actress and an activist. Despite my accent, which is an accent I developed at 11 um, so that I could fit in at my fancy secondary school, I grew up with no money and I was raised by a single mother on, and it, we relied on the council to provide us with housing. I grew up in a single parent home. She raised me and my brother and then, like I said, busted her ass every day and never had caught a break. And we almost had our home foreclosed on, I don't know how many times, and then she had to file for bankruptcy. When, you know, you've got less than $20,000 a year coming in, as opposed to other people who's got 50, 60, 80, 100,000 coming in, and you're going to school with these people, and they're looking at you like, why don't you have a nice car? And like, you have no clue how I live, how I grew up, <laughs> and that kills me. A few of us have grown up on like council estates and stuff, and I think when it's around music and performance, I think that people tend to listen a bit more. You want to hide this thing. Like, I felt ashamed of it. I felt ashamed of being poor. Hello, my name is Masuda Snaith, and today I'm doing a video for Project Twist It, who are challenging the way we talk about poverty. So I grew up on a council estate to a single parent mother who was living on benefits, and there were two things I really noticed growing up. One was that I was very aware of being poor and separated from mainstream society. And secondly, that there was this overriding image of council estates that were in the media that was largely based around drugs, gang violence and benefit fraud. And I remember on my first day in secondary school when I went to a school that was not in my council estate but in the neighbouring community, a girl sat next to me and when she found out I was from the estate, the very first question she asked me was, did I carry a knife? And that was quite shocking to me because I didn't know anybody who carried a knife. My name is Linda Tirado. I'm a writer. I live in the woods uh, and drink whiskey in keeping with my idiom. Um, and I write about how much it sucks to be poor. I live in Ohio, um, but I live in the West Virginia bit. My Walmart is over the Ohio River, so like technically I'm an Ohioan, but culturally West Virginian. I'm from Utah originally, so I'm a mountain girl. So I was a night cook in a tiny town in Utah, worked at an overnight shift at a diner, and I uh, told people on the internet that it sucked to be poor, which for some reason people considered news, and then uh, the very long internet comment I had written uh, was taken to be an essay and went very viral, and three weeks later I had a book deal, so then I wrote a book, um, because I'm not stupid and they offered me money, so I took it, and ever since then I've been a writer, because my book was largely about how much the service industry sucks, and it turns out you're not really terribly hireable in the service industry if you famously will write books about how much your bosses suck. There's two words that apply to my life, and they were a perfect descriptor in their totality, and one is exhausting and the other is hopeless, which, I mean, I, I worked two essentially meaningless, meaningless part-time jobs because it was the work I could get, took care of my husband and kids, and then I'd get up the next day and do it all over again. I mean, I'd, I'd have a 16-hour workday on an average day, and I'd come home with, you know, a hundred bucks to show for it, and with that I'm supposed to make some kind of a life, which, nope. When I cook occasionally, I have to sort of 
sometimes shrink the portions for everyone to sort of make it round everyone because we're quite a big family. I started writing for myself uh, because I couldn't find work as a director and I originally trained as a theatre director. Um, I couldn't find anything that I was passionate enough about to direct, I suppose. There was nothing out there at that time, and this is going back 10 years ago, that represented me. And as, an, as a Northern Irish person as well, there was nothing from my region that represented me. Um, and that's why I started to write I guess the way that I write and write for people from the working class minorities and it is a gross minority on stage. In the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, um, one of the things we've been clear on is that we have to shift the narrative. The narrative uh, because if you don't shift the narrative, but you can't do that without shifting the narrators, right? In middle class language, middle class, middle class, but you have 43.5% of your country poor and in low, poor or low income. And then, for instance, last year, two years ago, we go through a presidential election. 26, by my count, maybe more, maybe a little less, 26 presidential debate primary and, and not one hour on poverty. Something and low and low wealth that's impacting 43.5% of your country. Whatever people call themselves progressives or whatever name, we would be foolish to then stay in silos. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for coming tonight on this scorching February evening. Um, at least it didn't rain or there might have been just us in the front row here tonight, but thank you anyway. Um, so, personal thanks. Um, we're here to mark the publication of a book but I want to give a shout out to some of the people who've been involved in Project Twisted and who helped make all of this happen. Um, I want to thank in advance before they get up tonight, Masuda, Paul, and where are oh, <laughs> Natasha, and then Danny Dorling, who's, um, who wrote the forward to the book. Um, I'm really grateful to him for doing that. Um, to Alexis Harvey, Lizzie, Lizzie Hodgson, Danny, um, and Chris Caboli, who were involved in Project Twisted right from the start. Um, and I, I just wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Thanks to Abigail Scott Paul and JRF, um, who showed faith in the idea when I first started doing it. Everything in the short film that you just saw was made possible because of the teamwork and passion of people I got to work with, including so many with lived experience of poverty. And because so many people were willing to tell their stories or offer informed analysis about poverty and the blaming and shaming that so often accompanies it, so why create something like Project Twist It, of which the book is a part? Well, Project Twist It and this book were born of something that had been percolating through my work for some time. Increasingly, I was writing about and reporting on poverty, austerity, and inequality over a number of years, including for my Guardian column, Lesson from America. I found myself listening as more and more people made the same observations, as more and more people talked about the poverty narrative so some of the observations that were made were, one, that the blaming and shaming of poorer people by certain politicians, the media, and the culture more broadly is entrenched, and that it is harmful not just to individuals, but to communities and to wider society. It reduces empathy and it dehumanizes. Second, that the rhetoric around poverty, think underclass, skyver, welfare queen, and handouts, is reductive, morally wrong, and demeaning that the demonizing of poor and low-income people, but especially people receiving benefits, including disabled people, needs to be challenged head on. And that in order to do this, rather than be talked at or about, people with experiences of poverty need to be heard. And finally, that we must question the fundamental premise of the misleading poverty narrative that has tended to dominate in Britain and America over recent decades, namely, as the American scholar Chuck Collins put it, that people are where they economically deserve to be. That is, if you're poor or on the breadline, it must be down to personal flaws, a lack of personal responsibility or bad decision making, rather than the systems and structures that push people into poverty, helps keep them there and cuts off opportunities. Factors like low pay, precarious work, meager and cruelly configured benefit systems, austerity cuts, 
or in the case of the US, a lack of access to healthcare. And of course, there's the corollary of that, that if you're financially secure or well off, it's entirely down to you as an individual, having worked hard and having done the right thing. That may well be part of it, but there are also the structures that give you an advantage, such as being born into a family that was fortunate enough not to have to struggle to make ends meet, never knew food or housing insecurity, or had access to high, edu high quality education and social connections that helped you along the way. If you're inclined to think that the rhetoric used to demean poorer people or the wider narrative itself isn't of much significance or consequence, just words, I ask you to think again because words do matter. The stories we tell matter. Consider how austerity in this country was justified with a bulldozer of toxic rhetoric that framed people in need of benefits or certain public services as scroungers, crudely pitting them against the hardworking families as if people from poor households don't work hard. You only have to look at the number of people living in poverty where a member of the household is in work, and this is a group whose numbers are swelling, um, or those who deal with the everyday insecurity that is low wage, zero hours work, to see the fallacy of this dichotomy. The same goes for members of families who are carers, perhaps a parent, a partner, or a child. It should go without saying that caring for people, whatever your financial circumstances, is hard work. In building Project Twisted and writing The Shame Game, I have tried to highlight how, pover how the poverty narrative is the fuel we put in the machinery of inequality. And I've tried to push back against the dominant poverty narrative by focusing on the following. First, the reality of poverty for those living in it or who have experienced it in their own words, including the toll it takes emotionally and psychologically, as well as the broader fact that poverty is just bad for all of us that marginalizing, dismissing, or shaming whole swathes of our population takes us on a road to nowhere. Second, that certainly in my professional experience, I've observed the beginnings of a groundswell of activity to challenge this narrative, the stories we are told about the poorest in our society, which gives us an opportunity to harness this and build support for policies that lift people out of poverty and which help families and communities to flourish. It's easy, given the politics of our time in, in America and Britain, to give in to despair and to believe that things won't or can't change. Sometimes, as wealth and income shoots ever upwards into the hands of fewer and fewer super rich individuals, as social security is undermined, as our societies appear to fracture with political polarization, it's tempting to throw our hands up in the air. Just a couple of days ago, we had the Marmot Report, which showed that life expectancy is going into reverse for the poorest and how ferocious austerity cuts in the past 10 years have contributed to this terrible and completely avoidable development. But then sometimes you get to hear about and witness the work going on, and I've been fortunate enough to be in that position, work that is challenging the inequities of poverty, and to learn about those doing the heavy lifting, trying to bring about positive change. As soon as I really started looking into it, there were geezers of activity all over the place, taking on not just the injustice that is poverty, but the narrative that shores it up and the rhetoric that enables bad policy. I think there's a growing realization that the fact of poverty and the narrative are intimately interconnected. So that to advocate for change in policy or shift attitudes requires calling out the dominant narrative. On the short film earlier, you heard from Reverend Dr. William Barber, one of the figureheads of the Poor People's Campaign in the US. Now, the Poor People's Campaign is modeled on Reverend Martin Luther King's original version, and it's conceived as a fusion coalition of people with lived experience of poverty in the richest nation on earth, and the various allies working together to elevate the voices and experiences of poor and low-income people, and call out the shaming and blaming of the poor among us. Through peaceful civil action, advocacy, and activism, people on their own can't make much of an impact, yet they found they could together as part of the Poor People's Campaign. We've seen, despite sometimes depressingly dispiriting and a polarizing political environment, groups like Fight for 15 win victories on the minimum wage, politicians like AOC emerge and gain traction advocating on an anti-poverty platform, as well as democratic presidential contenders drumming home the issues of poverty and inequality. And then you have the organization Patriotic Millionaires, whose wealthy members are vocally advocating for higher taxes on the very rich and for a fairer system that doesn't hold people back. Here in the UK, uh, the painstaking work of grassroots and local organizations like Poverty Truth Commissions, Poverty to Solutions, and ATD Fourth World, who are also in the US, 
to carve out a space for people with lived experience of poverty, to be at the center of policy making and not an afterthought, if thought about at all. The adage that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu has never felt more apt. Change doesn't come about overnight, and it doesn't necessarily come from the top or the center. In those moments when I find it difficult to think about how we might begin once again to reduce the numbers of people in poverty or to stop blaming and shaming poorer people, I remind myself that it was once seen as ridiculous that women would have the vote or inconceivable that gay marriage would be introduced. And in something close to my own experience, I recall how when I was young, it was unimaginable that the troubles in Northern Ireland would come to an end and that the next generation, unlike my own, would not live in fear like I did. And I think of what the younger generation are doing right now to try to avert an environmental catastrophe, speaking up, speaking out, making their voices heard no matter how many times they're ignored. One singular aspect of Project Twisted that gave me genuine hope was the work we did with young people, including some who are here tonight. Devoid of cynicism that their elders sometimes show, these young people were able to call out the worst of what we have permitted to happen. Rather than harbor division, they seek to find common ground, to face down prejudice, and to be champions for a more inclusive future. What was most amazing was their acute grasp of how prevailing attitudes of the people in poverty or in need of government assistance was harmful and how stigmatizing it is that is only ever destructive, and how we can smash the labels and the slurs that are so casually leveled against those in our society least able to defend themselves. I learned a lot from these young people as I did from the many amazing individuals and organizations who gave up their time, energy, and stories to support Project Twisted and to feed into the book. I learned that there is absolutely no excuse why two of the richest nations on the face of this earth should be seeing child poverty rise. See so many of their citizens homeless or dying before their time. We have choices about the kind of society we want, and we have a duty to aspire to leave our young people with a more equitable society and one into than the one into which they were born. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, we must wipe out any feeling of intolerance, of belief that any one group could get ahead alone. We all go ahead together or we go down together. And as the Poor People's Campaign activist, as you saw in the short film, said, and they're absolutely right, we need to fight poverty, not the poor. Thanks. Let's start with this. What is poverty? What is poverty in the UK? What do you think it means to be living in poverty? Does this person look poor? How about this person? Does being poor mean you can't eat or only that you can't afford luxuries? How do you define luxuries? Why is it that as a young person, you're somehow responsible for your situation? I'm Billy J.D. Porter. As part of Project Twist It, we've been traveling the country, speaking to young people about their experiences and perceptions around poverty in the UK, and how we can challenge the unfair stigma around those who are struggling to make ends meet. I think everyone's a bit oblivious to it, to be honest. Um, I don't think people are particularly aware how serious it is. When you're poor, you don't ever really think you're poor. So I think poverty is definitely relative, but it's not completely about a lack of possessions. When I think about the public opinion of poverty, I think people see it as a really negative thing. People are really quick to judge people who um, don't have as much money and they're quick to blame it all on them. I feel like if people don't really know about it, they don't really care about it. So you don't really view yourself as being poor until you realise there's so many more people just much more privileged than you really. That is a big thing in this country as well, is ignorance and people not being educated about certain issues. So we focus on the whole thing on financial rather than educational poverty. I'm in Folkestone today visiting an organisation called Imago and they work a lot with young carers. So today I'm going to be meeting a group of young people, a variety of different ages, to talk to them about what their attitudes are around poverty in Britain today and what we can do to change that. 
What do you think of when someone says the word poverty? Do you all know what it means? Not really. No. Do you ever kind of speak about that? No, there's never any need to for us. I no? Guess. It's not something we talk about. We're very private people at school because my school life is very different from my home life. I right. don't really intermix the two. Why, why do you feel so the need to be so private? I don't trust anyone. Why? Because I know what they're like. They take the mick out of kids like me. It's something yeah. that like you st struggle with it go around the whole school because you're not like them. Like the kids, like especially on sort of tag days and stuff where you're going in your own clothes, if somebody says to you, you know, where did you get that from? And you say like, I don't know, like Primark or something like that. And um, they kind of then go around and they're like, why'd you do that? Like, well, you know, I can't always afford the most expensive things. And they go around and suddenly you have everybody saying to you, you know, this was 50 quid, do you want it sort of thing. With the sort of people that I hang around with, they're, they're living in Hawkinge with getting everything they want and they talk about poor people in sort of the bad way and then make me feel like they're friends with me because they pity me. What do you mean they talk about poor people in a bad way? What do they say? So they'll see someone that's not wearing branded clothes that, you know, buys £2 trainers because it's cheaper and they'll like laugh about it and sort of put them down because they don't have the money. So say if someone has to come to PE and everyone's got harachis on and they've got feelers, do you think they'd, do you think they'd be ashamed? Yeah. yeah. Unless you name year seven. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I wear that make shoes and that my shoes weren't like the best make so then I went home to my mum and told my mum I wanted some more trainers. So she had quite a with some more trainers. What if she couldn't have afforded those new trainers? I want to go and scoot up. <laughs> when you got the new trainers that was like everyone else's, did people treat you differently? Yeah, but I just looked I was like the lads like weren't like calling me or anything for like my trainers, I was looking at me like for them. Because everyone else had the same trainers as me. Where you guys have lots more responsibility than most people your age, you might be in charge of like budgeting, doing doing the shop, making the food, like what are some of the things that you have to take into account every day? When I cook occasionally I have to sort of sometimes shrink the portions for everyone to sort of make it round everyone because we're quite a big family and then it sort of changes because my parents are separated mm -hmm. so we sort of go to my dad's at the weekend and it's completely different, there's like massive portions of food and sometimes it makes me feel like different from that other side of my family because they've got everything they want and I'm sat there sort of in between the two. Me and my mum, we don't really have a lot of joy in our life at the moment so we try and make our own games up. So like, ooh, like what's the cheapest thing you can find? Our favourite game to play currently is um, like you'll find a tin of meat soup and see how much meat it's actually got in it. Oh, what, it's like 2%? Yeah, like we have to like <laughs> find the exciting things. Yeah. Like, but finding the cheapest stuff, we get it. One in five of the UK's population, that's 14 million people, are said to be living in poverty. To find out more about how poverty is officially defined, I'm meeting Dr. He Jung Chung, reader in sociology at the University of Kent. Well, the official definition of poverty is the, if you have less than 60% of the median wage, you're defined as poor. The median wage is if you line everybody according to their income, the person right in the middle. Mm -hmm. So. Obviously, that's the official definition, but you have to consider that depending on where you live, what your living conditions are, what your needs are, you could be poor and materially deprived even if you have 60% of the median wage. Our definition, official definition of poverty may not really capture the full extent to which people are deprived in this country. In form, we used to do activities and do like real life things. Like when when we was like talking about benefits and how like how it does help some people, um, a lot of people are like kind of saying, well, they're stupid and like th these people who don't work just need to get up and get a job. And that kind of hit me like, well, my parents aren't actually able to mm. sort of thing. And like my teacher knew that, and he was trying to make a stop to it, but the rest of the class, they was just like. They didn't really think about it, it just kind of they said what came out sort of thing. Yeah. One main thing I, I'd like to say is that technology impacts uh, education greatly. Um, technology allows education to be more widely available to um, everyone. 
if you have a smartphone, if you have a, a laptop, if you have a c computer, if you have the internet, if you have a computer at a library, if you're able to get to that library, um, you are then able to learn. It's because of technology that there aren't as many jobs around. A lot of companies now have automated phone systems so you don't have someone on a switchboard like you used to. That was something that I thought maybe I would be able to do when I finished college but there aren't really that many companies around that need that anymore. You see pictures on like social media of the Christmas tree with like mounds of presents uh, or you know they're getting the most expensive things possible and then you look at your own and sort of see the difference and then wonder why you're not getting the same because you're like you know friends with them or you're like similar to them and it just it's hard you know because we sort of learn to cherish what we've got whereas other people cherish what they want the recurring themes that kept on coming up in our sessions were young people's differing experiences at school and online. So what's happening? Nikki Varley is a youth worker at the UK's largest youth club, Wigan Youth Zone. She's also a musician, and this feeds into her work with young people. You know, a lot of the young people that we do work with, that, that might be living sort of below the poverty line. Um, I don't think necessarily they do identify as that. I think. There's a lot of um, the idea of making do with what you've got and um, we've got young people at the youth zone, you know, we sometimes wash the clothes, we're, we're sorting the food out because we've not got any food for, for the tea from the parents. So there's definitely there's definitely um, a lot of young people that would be put in that category but I don't think they identify as that themselves, no. So is that, is that your perception of poverty though? Yeah. Yeah, and damp walls, you have to live in a flat. And your house is scruffy and your clothes in the wash. And you live in a rough area. It's like the opposite of the community. Like, proper posture. Some people think that privilege is something that people that don't have better life just made it up, but it actually does exist and it's an issue that we need to tackle in terms of privilege them and how people don't really know about it and they just think, you know, I, I, have, I am where I am because of me, because I'm nothing else and I haven't been given head in life um, due to the fact that I've worked hard for it, but it's not always the case. The issue is that when you're in a, a place where your family is financially poor, that affects your education and it affects your opportunities. Um, and also, as Dominic's saying, in terms of mindset, um, a lot of the time, being in a financial situation, it means that you live in a certain area and that area has certain opportunities. And it's, it's all right and well to say, you know, well, if you just believe in yourself and work hard enough, you can get out. And that is true, but your influence is dictated a lot by what you have around you. And if what you have modeled for you is a family that's been poor generation after generation and they've never achieved, then it is quite difficult to, for you to break out of that. Being poor is not your fault. Being not able to get a good job that's well paid is also not your fault. And I think there's a lot of kind of this, this perpetuating idea that, oh no, it's you, it's you that you can't make it. And, and again, as you say, a lot of that actually makes people more anxious and depressed and it actually leads to more problems. It is your right to get those benefits. It is your right to, as a citizen, to have a decent life. Even if you're in um, uh, even a ghettoized area or an area that is in a, has a stigma for being of a certain class or economic background, the idea that it's more than just that, it restricts your mind and it restricts your movement. We met Kieran Cranston at one of our discussion workshops in London. He wanted to share a few further ideas he'd had since. How do you think that we can improve the perception then of people who are coming from a background that might be dealing with, with financial struggles? Um, I would say definitely interaction, uh, community cohesion. Um, so even if um, in schools, for example, they were to teach more the idea of home economics, so whether that's 
um, learning about money and budgeting, or even having sessions where you go out into the community um, and you meet people, or you get more involved with your local government, and you start to get an understanding of how the system works and how you manage to benefit from the system, but also an idea of how others might not have the same privilege or yeah. the same experience. No two people's experiences of poverty will be exactly the same, but the takeaways from our sessions always revolved around the need to promote understanding. How can young people be more accepting of those living in poverty if there's no basic awareness of the problems at hand and how common they are? If we talk to more people about it, like not necessarily what we're going through, but like how it feels and that, they, it can maybe help them understand. It just shows that, you know, when we do take a bit of responsibility for our, our own communities in, and giving back, then, then it, can, it can help people. So let's end with this. Ask yourself again, what is poverty? What is poverty in the UK? And what does it mean to be living in poverty? Can we change the narrative around poverty? Life, give me something to believe in. No lies, just something to believe in. I'm I, the only one that's grieving. These things that belong to you, neither they are thieving. This whole world's got me hurting, got me feeling undeserving Got me questioning my worth in this sad system that we're serving Find no place in this twisted race for property Is making profit the sole aim of humanity Protect the banks, bring out the tanks if they disagree While we're at it, let's invest some more in military All our friends have shares, so why shouldn't we? Markets are demanding that we give away for free Everything our grandparents fought for to some company It's called wealth creation It's more efficient, you see I'm sorry, Alfred. Good evening. My name is Paul Atherton and I'm a fellow in this fine institution. I've come up to be the lived experience moment of the evening. I have been homeless for just over a decade. It started in 2009 with a credit file error, which prevented me from renewing my tenancy. I suffer with a disability known as chronic fatigue syndrome, and the stress of the situation resulted in a three-month hospital bed stay in St. Thomas's. When they discharged me from there, they discharged me into a hostel in Brixton. And I was there for just under two years. While I was there, they gave me an option of either signing up to social housing, and they said that would take about nine to 10 years to resolve. Or alternatively, I could go into the private rented sector and I could sign up uh, for an organization at the time called Lettings First. And if I signed up with Lettings First, they would assist and help me get into private tenancy and solve the problem. Only problem was, Lettings First ceased to exist a month later. And because of that, I then lost my right to social housing. The DWP then decided to stop all my benefits. A concurrent problem, over the last 10 years, the DWP have stopped my disability benefits three times, each time for over a year. This means that you find yourself in a trap that's almost impossible to get out of. You can't address anything in respect to trying to solve the problem. And the worst part about that is that when you try and talk to the press or organizations generally, people, as you've heard, will immediately say, well, it must be your fault. You can't be homeless for 10 years unless you've done something wrong. And the issues for me started, as I say, with a credit file error. Credit file didn't have anything to do with me. Experian and Equifax just refused to remove a debt that was on my file, that had been proven not to be mine, that had a massive impact on my credit score, so I couldn't rent. Estate agents will not rent to you if you don't have a good credit score, and nearly everything now has a good credit score. I'm sure most of you read today that the, uh, there's been a case in the High Court where they're going, finally, we 
are going to allow estate agents to say to, to rent to people on welfare. That won't happen. It just you just won't see people saying we don't take people on welfare. But they'll still figure ways of not doing it. And the main reason is because if you're a landlord, the likelihood of you getting paid regularly is pretty slim. One of the hardest things I had to, to deal with throughout all of this is that the DWP refused to email me. So when you're homeless and disabled, you never know where you're going to be. You don't know how uh, well you're going to be, whether you can engage on a telephone. So email became the most important thing for me to communicate with the department. So when they refused, I decided to take them all the way through judicial review to the royal courts here in London. I did it as a litigant in person, did it myself. And the judge acknowledged that my human rights and my disability rights had been breached for over a decade. But nothing else happened. So that meant that they did finally decide that they would communicate to me uh, via email, but they didn't compensate for any of the problems. They didn't do anything. But the most interesting thing, the most important thing about this was the press became interested, and they started talking to me. And they said, oh, this, this is an interesting case. Will you come speak? And I go, oh, of course I'll come speak. And then they take my photograph, and then the story wouldn't run. Because I do not look, stereotypically, like a homeless person. And they need me to be sat in a box with a begging bowl, looking very poor and forlorn. And all the time, this kept coming back to the narrative and how important it is to get across the real stories that are going out there. Yes, people are drag addicts. Yes, people can be alcoholics. But there are no difference in terms of those figures between people who are homeless and people who are housed. And we don't talk about the people who are housed in the same way. We don't say, oh, you're an alcoholic, but you still got your house, so it's OK. We go, you're an alcoholic, and you haven't got a house, so that's your fault. And I think that's the narrative that needs to change. It's the communications that we use need to be addressed in the press, and the press need to communicate it to the public, and the public need to react accordingly. And the stories that we're hearing time and time again is that people are desperate, desperate to keep the narratives that they believe exist going. So I did a photographic exhibition a couple of weeks ago called Paul Atherton's Greatest Londoners in the Oxo Gallery. And it included a, a CEO here and a lot of people like Heather Mills, from Private Eye and all people I knew and all people who'd supported me. And the idea of the exhibition was to get people in and to ask them the question, if I have the support of all of these individuals, all of these people in power, all of these people in influence, and I can't solve the problem, what chance people who don't? And the people who came in would almost always say, yes, but you're the exception. Everybody else is the drunk and the alcoholic. <laughs> it's like, no, um, I am in a pecking order of things. I'm probably more unique than some. But the reality is that actually the narrative that I'm telling here is the majority of people. The majority of people get stuck in these problems because of the system and the process, not because of anything they've done wrong. And I think that fundamentally is the most important thing to take away tonight. And when people talk, and if you can talk to journalists, and if you can encourage people across the board, that it's the most important thing is that we are all individuals. People who are without houses are still part of the same society and the same groupings and have the same experiences and have this different backgrounds exactly the same as people who have houses do. Um, and that's what I'd like to leave you on. So if you can go out there, speak to others, talk to journalists, get them to say something different from the stereotypical narrative that we've all had to endure. Thank you. I'm going to not speak any more than I have, I hope, because I've got these two amazing women here. Um, Masuda and Natasha, um, if you haven't read their books, read them, buy them, give them to other people, because they're absolutely extraordinary. 
Um, both of them were great champions of Project Twisted right from the very start, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Um, and one of the things about Project Twisted, Twisted that we really wanted to highlight was, the, was storytelling and was narrative. So I'd love to hear from you guys about why that matters. Why does fiction matter in this big tapestry of talking about poverty and inequality? Yeah, for me, and you're probably the same, is it's about authentic voices. It's about changing, as Paul was saying, the story that people, kind of their preconceived ideas of what it means to come from poverty. Um, come from council, I come from council house, one parent family in, the, in Cornwall, in rural, very rural area. And a lot of people think Cornwall is kind of, it is beautiful and we have a lot of homelessness, we have a lot of poverty and it's something that a lot of people don't address in my own county and, that, and the reason for that is because people don't want that story. People want the story that they read about, the story that they, you know, when they go on holiday, that's the story that they want. So for me as a fiction writer, it's really important to change the story and change people's um, perception of what it is to be homeless or what it is to, to be poor and what it is to be working class. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was very similar to you, Natasha. Um, I grew up on a council estate in Leicester um, and the thing I kind of noticed as I was... And as the people said in the film, you don't know you're poor when you're growing up. It's, everybody was in the same situation, especially my primary school. It's really when I moved to secondary school that I noticed... When I worked, and that was a working class area still, but I noticed the difference. Um, but I think as I grew older, I noticed that whenever council estates, particularly in a state city council estates, I don't think rural council estates are represented at all, actually. But when inner city council estates were represented, it was always negative. It was always drugs, violence, like I, like I said, uh, benefit fraud. And it was just wasn't my experience at all. There's a lot of laughter and community um, in, in these kind of areas. Not always, but, but definitely had that feeling where I grew up. So when I, um, I've always wanted to be a writer, but so when I wrote the first draft of my first novel, which was when I was 16, which makes me sound far more clever than I am, um, <laughs> it took me a long time to actually get it published, I just sat on my council estate because that was easy to research. It was right there. Um, and I didn't really think twice about it until I came back to it and I wrote, I, I was writing it, I was thinking, actually, this is really important because I'm showing a different side to count. It's, it's, it's set in a council estate, it's got a British Bangladeshi girl that grows up in a council estate, so not autobiographical at all. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not necessary. Funny. I think, yeah, it's got humour. I, think I, I try and inject a bit of humour in all, all my work, I think. But that's not the main drive, that just happens to be part of her life. The same with my second novel, which focuses on a homeless girl who goes on a Wizard of Oz style adventure from Nottingham to Skegness, <laughs> is my pitch. Did you do that? <laughs> um, that I could, that's that's research. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, again, I wanted to kind of show, to break stereotypes, and I think Paul, what Paul was talking about kind of resonates so much with the research I got, because I haven't uh, been homeless myself, so mm. I knew I had to do the, get the research right, mm. because I know what it feels like to have stereotypes yeah. reinforced <clears throat> in the media, in fiction. I, I had to do lots and lots of research for that. Um, so I think, yeah, narratives and stories, it can make all the difference to how people see you. Mm. Um, and we are social creatures. We love story. We need, we need to find out about each other to survive. Yeah. <laughs> so story kind of grabs people by the throats and, and, and can really I engage I think also them. what you said about humour is really mm. important because a lot of people think, especially at the moment with the kind of poverty porn thing that we, we, we keep mm. seeing, is to tell stories that are, are working, uh, for us working class writers, we're telling stories that are also f can have humour mm. and, and we're, we kind of, our communities are, can be very positive. Yeah. The way that my mum would leave us with neighbours when she had to work cleaning jobs in the local hotel. It's, it's that sort of thing. And a lot of people think that, it, you know, it is the negative kind of stereotype mm. of, of the drugs and the, and the drink and everything else and abandonment. We've, we were so loved as kids on yeah. our little council estate. Mm. Yeah, you had the good and the bad, but you were well loved and you, it was very much community in a kind of an old-fashioned way. I think a lot of people from other social groups perhaps don't have that anymore and I, and I like to think that maybe working class kids and kids who are from poverty 
still have that. And for us as writers, we're really very positive. We want that positive message to, to kind of go forward. And work we do in schools when we talk to younger people is to say, you can be represented. You can do this. We are representing you, and you can do this. We have done it, and you also can become writers if you want to. You can do anything you want. It's hard, but you can do it. And because people will tell you not to kind of, not to do those it's things. It's a really important point, isn't it? Because to have those voices, we need the space for those voices to get in. So, how, and I know you have been doing a lot of work on this in particular, Natasha. So, how do we, how do we sort of shape an industry around storytelling and publishing that helps get those voices and those stories into the public's consciousness? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, some people know that I've kind of been working on a working class writers festival yeah. for the last couple of years and, and really kind of talking to everybody, not just working class people, but, but what do people want? What would it look like? So I, we're not ghettoizing working class writing because like some people say, oh, I'm middle class, but I'd really like to come and be in the audience. It's like, well, that's kind of the whole point, is for you know, people to share their story. We don't just want to talk and you know, have a pint of, of ale and talk about our, our, our story. We want to share our stories and, and for that to go, especially in the publishing industry, we want people to hear these stories and, and publish those authentic stories. So the idea of the Working Class Writers Festival is to do that, is to give lots of people a platform who maybe aren't represented at the moment so we can kind of celebrate their writing and bring people together and experience each other's stories that are kind of an authentic way again. Before we do the Q&A and comments, um, can you tell us what you're working on right now? I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually I've begun working on my third novel and I'm probably a bit too early yeah, to yeah. start talking about it. But however, I am, as I just remembered, <laughs> yeah. another project I'm doing. So I am actually working um, on a project called Colonial Countryside, which is mm -hmm. um, a brilliant project. Um, I'd look it up if I were you, because it, it's, it's a great project that's connecting 10 National Trust properties with a number of school children and 10 commissioned writers, and we're looking at the colonial connections of countryside houses. Oh, cool. As you can imagine, yeah, it has there's... quite a lot of connections. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but we never talk about it. Again, it's these, these stories we never talk about. Um, and I, I think people can be a bit like, why are you trying to rewrite history work? Leave history alone. <laughs> and it's like, history is, is, is the stories that haven't been, been told, told in history. The, their stories are all there. Mm. We just don't hear them. And I think that, that's the same with, with these stories of, yeah. of poverty of working class, mm. um, stories and narratives. Um, and I know when I was growing up, I didn't know if I could call myself working class because my mum didn't work. <laughs> so I thought, what class? Am I in? Because, like, like I said, my secondary school was a working class um, kind of area. So I felt like I was this underclass, this, this class that just wasn't spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the things we don't talk about, I think, are really important for us to get those stories out. Natasha, what do you... Um, Show off a bit. Tell okay, people well, <laughs> hello, my name's Natasha Carfew, and I have... <laughs> I published with Bloomsbury and with Hachette, and um, <laughs> what else? Virago, we're both in a, a oh, collection yeah. later on this year with Virago. Not like we'll talk about that yet. <laughs> um, whoops. And funnily enough, uh, my, my new book, I've got a book coming out in a couple of months with the National Trust. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, I've, I've written it about a mine, um, a famous mine called Levant Mine in Cornwall. But it is interesting because they're, I think they are starting to look at the kind of mm. the history because they can't kind of turn a blind eye to all these big houses and where the money came from and the slave trade and that sort of thing. Um, so it's funny that we're both working, working mm. on that. Um, so, yeah, lots going on at the minute. Thank yeah. you. So I've been told that, I'm, that I've got to put this out there. So um, I'd love to hear people's questions, comments for any of us. And I... Amanda, would you would you want to ask something? No, you're all right. <laughs> you're all right. So does anyone have any questions or anything about the book, about the project, about any of the work? Don't be shy. Danny? Do you know everyone in this room, Mary? <laughs> this is a genuine question. Um, you don't ask genuine questions. I, I do. No, no, I really don't know the answer to this. It's, uh, you mentioned the Marmot Report, which came out, I think, two days yeah. ago. And it was the main headline on the BBC News. Mm. And after the BBC reported on its findings, 
uh, that life expectancy was falling, particularly for poorer people and so on. It then cut to a clip, and it did this on the lunchtime news, the six o'clock news, and the 10 o'clock news. And the clip was of school children in a school in the northwest of England who are being taught at the age of six or seven or eight in a poor area how to go back to their parents and tell them how to behave like better people. And I'd never seen, it was a kind of new level of blame the victim. It was, mm. um, and you can, you can see it, it'll be on, it was the main story. And so my question is, people who study poverty tend to be nice people, but shouldn't we shame people who do that and actually have, say, a set of awards for the most crass reporting in the year <laughs> that, that blames people for the situation that they're in? better at that stuff than I am, Danny. You've done, he's basically done that in the forward to the book, I think. So, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the thing for me is that I don't, you know, I want to end blaming and shaming. So I, I'm like, I'm uncomfortable with um, doing that to other people. What I'd rather do is hopefully, you know, educate those people. And by those people as well, I mean, I mean journalists. Um, because you know, on a lot of social issues, there's often work going on behind the scenes to help journalists understand that the language they use, the photographs that they use, the stories they choose to tell have a much greater resonance than they think, um, that they have a much greater impact, especially on children. Um, one of the things that I've written quite a lot about is the internalizing of shame. And I, I know for myself, when I was a young person, I did that um, and I tried for many, many years to pretend that that wasn't the case, but it was. And I think right across the culture, be it poverty porn, as was um, mentioned earlier, be it news reports, be it drama, be it any of the cultural sources that we absorb, um, we take that in. And if you're struggling, then you begin to believe that everybody either pities you or despises you. Um, and I think journalists in particular have a responsibility to not feed into that, not just because it's inaccurate, but because it has very long-term and real consequences. When I was looking at studies on attitudes, et cetera, when I was researching the book, and one of the things that came up was people thinking that empathy had decreased across the society. And I think that's a really important point. And I think one of the reasons why that tends to happen is because we don't, we don't meet each other. We don't talk to people from different backgrounds. I mean, I'm sort of, you know, compared to say my siblings, I'm a bit of an oddity because, you know, I went to university. I, mixed with lots of different kinds of people, you, you, know, you, you learn that all people are just people at the end of the day. And I think we can feed into stereotypes and we can easily demonize if we're not in contact with people. Um, and I think throughout austerity, and I mean, you know, I was sort of rolling around in the, the hellscape of that, um, that uh, one of the worst things I witnessed in that period was the demonization of people with disabilities. I just couldn't believe it was happening. It was, I'm still shocked 10 years later um, but I do think that unless we find a way to um, desegregate our society, and I don't use that word lightly because I grew up in a segregated society, mm. like a truly segregated society, um, but I feel like we often self-segregate, um, and I think the media does feed that. Um, it helps us, you know, we all want to feel good about ourselves. We all want to think that everything we've ever done in our lives has made us a good person or got us to where we are, but it isn't just about us, is it? It's about everybody. And I think the more that we can speak up and use any forum, any platform, whatever it is, mm -hmm. to, to just say our truth. And I think that's as much as certainly I think I can do, but I genuinely think the more of us that do it, the better. I think also to call people out, because mm -hmm. it's quite, especially in this country, we're all very polite, you know, <laughs> and, and someone might say something that's really kind of offensive and we kind of go, Ooh. you know, and, and you say, you've got to say, no, that's wrong. That's completely yeah. wrong. You're wrong. You're, you're, you're racist, you're sexist, you're homophobic, or whatever it's going to be. You're, 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 you're anti-disabled people. Jokes, things that are jokes, yeah. like, like the Andy Pip. You know, it is. It's, it's, it, things are offensive, and you have to say, that's offensive, even if it doesn't offend you. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, we've got to kind of be offended for everybody, and then that's how yeah. the community, we come back together. Yeah, you don't want me in a pub with you, because that, that hands up it's every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw me out. <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. So I've got my... OK, well, you do, and then this gentleman. Right. And Carol from Lewisham Food Bank. We've noticed... Um, Hi, Carol. Carol. Hiya. Carol was involved in the project as well. Oh, I... <laughs> um, universal credit. I mean, we've, as well as us, just 30% more use because of uh, food bank use. 
but we've seen it, people coming in feeling demeaned by it. And I just wondered from your research and stuff like that, whether you'd come across the effects, almost the universal credits having on people's mental health as much as anything else. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that was foreshadowed right at the start of the um, growth of food banks in this country, because like in 2012, 2013, I was out on the sort of front line seeing what was happening and everyone was predicting that we're gonna, there was gonna be more demand. But like, absolutely, people do not want to be there. People, you know, hang their heads going in, you know, people want to have their dignity and they felt that these being, in, whilst they were necessary, them being introduced as actually a new dimension to feeling really bad about needing help or being poor. And I think certainly what the research has um, showed us, and I, I know the Trussell Trust have come out with quite comprehensive research on this, that universal credit and the problems of its rollout have had a direct impact, not just financially on people, but in terms of their mental health. Um, and I know Paul mentioned earlier, but the, you do, the, the, you do get sort of stuck in this terrible cycle of poverty. And the question becomes, are we doing the things to help people get out of it? Or are we actually doing things that make them stay in it and that make all of those problems multiply? And then it's even harder to get out of it. So yeah, like, I completely agree. I think all, there's an absolute and direct link between the policies and how people live their lives. And, you know, obviously my interest in, at the moment is how that is justified and it's justified with rhetoric and it's justified with a narrative that shames people and blames them. So, so one of my friends is currently using a food bank, has been using one for a long time. Um, and um, thinking about what you were saying about um, kind of getting stuck in the system. So I have somehow managed to get out of um, my situation because my mum was really focused on education um, not just because she was an Asian mom, but she just was very <laughs> focused on us. And we didn't really go out because she wouldn't really let us go out onto the council estate. But my friend has been stuck in this kind of cycle um, of, and has st stayed on the council estate and her mental health has deteriorated. So I always think when people um, talk about, oh, cushy life living on a council estate, it's like, would you choose to live on a council estate? No. So, you know, it's not a cushy life. She... She barely leaves that little mm. bubble. Mm. She has to rely on food banks. She, her husband's now disabled. The universal credit has completely screwed them over. There's no other way of, of, of talking. I mean, he doesn't even, he's still going through many assessments because of the way the DWP yeah. is now working. Um, so it's, it's everyone I think on that estate has mental health issues. Mm. And you know, I, it, it's, a, it's a terrible way to be treated. And it's, a, it's often a hidden thing as well because like you get that again with disability where people think you know if you don't see someone's phys physical disability then you're not really disabled so hence you get those news stories about fakers and because mm -hmm. like one tiny tiny sort of fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people are idiots um well, yeah. you know, <laughs> like every... that's happened to jim i mean to have jamil yeah. up there yeah um mm -hmm. and if you are a person who puts this is why it's so difficult that you put yourself if you now. put your head above the parapet people do hound you and yeah. you know you have to be have a really strong resilience to be able to fight against it and know you're fighting the good fight because she the way she's been hounded for yeah. having a disability and not appearing to mm. have a disability or having you know, uh, a posher accent when, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, all the things, and, that, and that's the thing I think, if you talk to us, you n might not necessarily know that we're from a, po a poor background, mm. so people will say things to you, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people will say yeah, things yeah, yeah, to you yeah, and you'll have to be like, I actually grew up on a council yeah, yeah, estate, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, especially when the term chav was being used yeah. kind of quite liberally. Yeah. I have to be like, whoa, oh. wait a minute, I thought I knew who you were, <laughs> now I really don't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a tricky one. People slip into those stereotypes really quickly, don't yeah. they? Mm. And that's, that's the thing, that's the storytelling mm. to try and get people to kind of, to start thinking differently. And that's really what it's all about is thinking differently and if we can do that as storytellers so when people read our stories these are characters and these are real lives mm -hmm. and these are incredible people mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. I yeah. always um, say if I think if I wrote a report about everything I learned about homelessness from my research people might read it probably wouldn't <laughs> and they might think oh that's that's terrible but I think reading a novel where you're put into someone's shoes and like I say she's going on an adventure so you're going on an adventure story and then 
as you go along, you find out all the things mm. that have happened to mm. her and how she has ended up in this situation. You're living in her shoes for... A, mm. That's the power of story. You, you are living in those shoes for a, a few hours every day. Yeah. And then suddenly, I've had people say, I just look at homeless people in a completely yeah. different light now. Right. That's what we want. Yeah, yeah. We've got one time for one short question before we round up. And please come and ask. I'll try to make it short. Uh, when we blame the system or yeah. we blame the politicians, we forget that in the UK, civil servants have complete immunity. And there's a big problem because the person who literally screw over the life of Paul, for example, none of them, you have no recourse neither to them nor to the DWP nor to anybody. And it comes to the point where people are dying and you have to remember what people follow in orders did in other places. So we have to abolish the immunity that civil servants have. Civil servants can do completely ruin the life of somebody, and they are not liable, neither them, nor the ministers, nobody. In theory, the minister should resign. Who resigned because Paul Asseton was sent to court 10 times, and he won the 10 times? I was with him once, witnessing that, and it was laughable. It, the judge was saying, what the hell are these guys doing? How do you lose nine times and bring somebody to court for the tenth time? So I think in the current climate, we're in a situation where it's not just people being shamed, but the people doing the shaming are shameless. Well, so, we, need to begin yeah, to, we need um, to begin to shame the public servants that forget that being a civil servant means that you're a public servant. We need to uh, stop yeah. allowing people making mistakes and ruining people's lives. So yeah. my question is, can we do something not just to blame the politicians or to blame the system, but to begin blaming individuals? Well, because you would be sacked from your job yeah. if you did something like that in the private sector. Well, it's interesting because there have been, I mean, and certainly as a journalist, I've spoken to whistleblowers, for instance, who have come out and talked about what it's like on the inside and people who have walked away from those jobs um, because they um, could not d deal with the humiliation that was going on. So and I'm really conscious of time, but we can definitely talk afterwards. And um, Thank you. I know there's someone desperate to ask a question at the back, but I can't see. Oh, hi there, Mary. I'm Patrick Vernon. Hi, Patrick. And um, great book. I'm still reading it. And um, in terms of your book, do you think there's an extension around shame, particularly around the issues around the hostile environment and the Windrush scandal and the parallels in, in your book? Yeah, well, I do, I do mention the Windrush in there, actually, because I sort of try to draw the wider culture into it. So whilst this has been going on for a long, long time, I think our current politics is you know, very dangerous, really, in terms of the, you know, the segmenting of people and pitting people against each other. And that, that includes this, you know, and it's a hostile environment for a lot of groups in our society, mm. for a lot of groups. I don't think it's coincidence that no. um, the rise in hate crimes for, against um, racist hate crimes, against LGBTQ, against all of these hate crimes is kind of, ha the bigger our divide it yeah. kind of gets between yeah. the rich and the poor. I don't, mm. I don't think that's... Uh, it's not, not a coincidence, yeah, I totally coincidence, agree. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to, even though I don't want to, because I want to touch um, sort of say thank you to Natasha and Masuda for being here and talking to us and telling us about their work. Um, and then we're going to have one more little thing, I think, and then, then we're done and everyone can go down and get a Diet Coke or something. <laughs> <laughs> My preferred poison. Um, so should I just go up and, like, I'm being told to do this. I love this. <laughs> right, okay, so... Um, I just, uh, I want to thank everybody, again, um, for being here and who contributed. Um, for Foyle's Bookshop, who are here flogging the books on our behalf, which should be good. Um, to Policy Press, who published it. To Mary, who organised this evening. Thank you very much, because it was like, you know, we're trying to cram a lot in, which is what we've done, um, to the whole team. Um, I want to leave you with just a short piece of audio um, from a woman I interviewed but never got to meet who I just, she, I just thought she was amazing. And she passed away recently. Her name is Maureen Roberts. Um, and like I've interviewed a lot of people, but I really took away from that Maureen's warmth and humor and her humanity and her insights. Like, remarkable woman. I just apologize in advance because I wasn't recording it for broadcast. So it's pretty, that's not good quality. And you can hear me rustling around in the background <laughs> trying to take some notes. Um, so if you can excuse that, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. When you're poor, that's all people see. That's the only community you're allowed. You're a scally from a bad place. And it's so hard to get people to look beyond that 
and see the real you. One of the dimensions of poverty was unrecognised contributions. And when we were doing the research and also our own project, The Roles We Play, that we did a few years back, um, what came over strongly was the perception of people in poverty is they do nothing. They watch television and take benefits and do nothing. They contribute nothing and continue to breed another generation of television watchers. What come over strongly, both in our work with roles we play and in the research, is what people are doing. They're supporting other people. They do voluntary work. They babysit for a mum so that she can have a bath in peace. They do shopping for people. They look in on elderly neighbours. There are so many different activities that people in poverty do, partly because they do have a bit of time, partly because they live close to other people in poverty and they see the need. My children, between them, they must have saved the nation million. They take me to and from hospital. They look after me. They take, they, you know, do shopping. They, they do so many of the little tasks that I can't do. And uh, if I was alone, they would have to send carers in, get me out of bed, help me with the shower, put my washing in the machine and take it out. All those little things that someone would have to come in and do for me, empty my bins, go on the computer when there's things, websites, I, I'm no good at computers. Websites I don't understand, but I need things. They, they will do that. I could never in a lifetime find the money to reward them for what they've done. What most people experience when they begin to think about the whole aspect of poverty, they feel angry that they have been trapped in this position, sometimes bitter, sad, but then when given an opportunity to use what they've experienced to perhaps change things for the future, they get passionate. They get intent that this should not happen to another generation. This should not happen to anyone else. Thank you, everyone. This has been an amazing evening. I'm afraid that we're now out of time, so we do have to wrap up the session. So thank you all for coming and for being part of the audience here to kind of listen to and take in some of these stories um, and encourage you to think about what it is that you might be able to do differently, kind of coming away with some of these stories in your mind today. Apologies if we didn't get a chance to take your question, um, but we will have a, a chance to continue the conversation downstairs in Rothmel's now. So you can exit via the atrium staircase and follow the signs to minus two to the long gallery and staff will be around to help you find your way. But I encourage you to take some time to meet each other in the audience and the speakers in the room. Um, Mary will be signing books and there will be a chance to have a drink, connect, and find much more about the fantastic work of Project Twist It, um, and the work that we are also doing here at the RSA across a number of related action research projects, including in education, economic insecurity, health, well-being in place, all supported by our amazing fellowship community. So do join me in Rothmel's in the Long Gallery, but before we head down, please give one more big hand to our terrific speakers, Paul, Natasha, Masuda, and Mary. Thank you.